All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is another edition of Moon Tower Business Podcast. Uh, in studio, we have Will Roman, uh, who is the head of uh, Chizos Boots. Uh, maybe I pronounced that wrong again. Pr- Chizos Boots. Chizos Boots. Chizos Boots. You nailed it. But the, the one thing I'm more concerned about is we're not actually in studio, guys. We're doing social distancing. That That's actually true. <laughs> Good uh, point. It, Good point. Today is Earth Day, and uh, we are all, uh, we are all, Broadcasting from our from our house, and uh, Will's with us. We have Ben Murray, who's the co-host, and uh, and we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about Will's venture and his background and and how he got started in in the boot boot uh, business, and then uh, and we'll we'll have some good questions for him. So Will. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the owner, and I like to call myself the chief Texan of Chisos Boots. Uh, uh, you know, when you one of those things that's uh, you might as well have a little fun with it, right? So we don't try, we don't take ourselves too seriously over here. But you know, I'm originally from Austin. I was born here and grew up, you know, between here and Houston, and then came back and went to Texas State and then uh, University of Texas. That's awesome. So you're you're originally from Austin. That's correct. Yes, sir. Yeah, one of the very few, right? It seems to be that way. You know, there's a secret handshake. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So um, how did you get in, into in the boot industry? What, what, what kind of drove you to that? What, how'd you get started with that? I mean, I, I think like most, you know, Texans who either are born here or got here as fast as you could, you know, mm-hmm. boots are the oldest pair of footwear that I remember wearing. And I've got all those little pictures of me as a kid with the, with the boots. You always got a red pair. That's right. And, uh, and, and it just, you know, and then honestly, I kind of reconnected with that part of my identity in college. And, um, and so it's always kind of been there. You know, I don't think I never set out to own a boot company or to make cowboy boots, you know, in a weird way. It's, it's kind of like when you're a kid, you're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's like, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a cowboy. It's like, I kind of became a cowboy a little bit. So, you know, 10, <laughs> nice. ten year old me is doing backflips. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, but I mean, how, how, so how far back do you want me to go? I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of little twists and turns that kind of led to this moment. I mean, talk, talk about all of it. Talk, tell me what, where, where the journey began. You know, I think that, you know, as I said, I think that, that, that seed was kind of always there being a Texan. Um, but, you know, man, was it six years ago or so? I did a road trip through Mexico, a uh, solo road trip. I took off from Austin and I drove all the way down to Tulum and back and, and part of that took me through the, you know, the hill country of Mexico. You know, you have the state of Guanajuato and it's stunning. You have the city of Guanajuato and you got San Miguel de Allende and, and Leon, et cetera. And it made me aware of the leather industry when that was there, just by kind of casually coming in contact with it. So again, that was like almost like the second seed was there. Right. And, you know, I... Uh, Right before this, I has a co. I was a co-founder of a crypto company, believe it or not, uh, with some good friends, and you know we had a a really rough uh, 2018. And so after you know, into December, uh, I went. I needed to recharge, and so I go where I always go, which is west. I went out to Big Bend, and that's where this journey really took off. So we're, we're talking January of 2019 and, you know, a little bit of background for listeners out there is, is, you know, I had a couple of back injuries in my twenties and a motorcycle accident. And, and so it made wearing cowboy boots really tough, but I'm stubborn. And so I did it anyway. And then I would deal with the back pain for a few days afterwards. And so I tried to solve this on my own. I tried to buy different brands. Uh, I would buy a half or a full size up and put an insert in there and, and all these things. And I just kind of thought it was something I had to live with. And so I'm out in West Texas and uh, at the end of a long day, just looking down at my feet and my back is hurting and it just dawned on me. It's like, why don't I just try and do this myself? You know, there's that famous last words, like how hard could it be? <laughs> right. You found, you, found uh, a pro- you found a problem and you wanted to solve it. Yeah. You know, in, in, in a weird way. So it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't like I set out with this big lofty ambitions. It was like, okay, how do I, how do I fix this for myself? And so from there, it all kind of started. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I really, yeah. uh, looking and doing some research, I really like the idea of what you're doing with the boots and, you know, the comfort up front. Uh, I've always wanted a pair of 
cowboy boots, but that's one of the things that scares me is just putting forth the effort to break those things in. So agreed a hundred percent, you know, and so you, you touched on a very good point, which is there's always been this break in period. So it's, you know, number one, do we still need that now? You know, I mean, we, we've come a long way in terms of how we understand leather technology and everything else. And, and our uses for them have, have changed a bit. And the second piece of that would be, uh, you know, the actual foot comfort. You know, traditionally, they're made 100% to ride in the saddle. You don't need to walk around in them. And but we use them differently now. Now you're going to be doing multiple things with them. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, 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 I literally feel your pain. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I... I I totally can can uh, can relate to that when it comes to comfort and boots. I've I've owned a lot of different pairs of boots over the years, and noticed the difference between you know just a one pair that that fits kind of tight and doesn't it's not very comfortable to um, another pair that's just real soft leather and I'm almost feels like you're wearing like tennis shoes maybe you know what I mean so it, it makes a big difference. Absolutely, and and the other thing that I discovered when I when I started going down this is I mean like we just said I mean I set out trying to solve my own problem of comfort, and you know I I started cutting open my own boot collection which was painful <laughs> I I would go to you know Goodwill and buy used boots and cut those open and started trying to you know merge what I had read online and read in books with actually seeing it in person, and what I started to discover is that not only were there some patterns here of why things weren't comfortable, but also a lot of people are starting to cheapen their boots and starting to cut corners, you know? So there's, there was this quality aspect that I started to discover too. And, you know, when you go out and you talk to ranchers and you talk to, you know, folks who are using their boots and, and beating the hell out of them, you know, they'll tell you which brands are more durable. You know, universally, they're not generally not comfortable, but they, but they are, there are some that are more durable than others. And when you cut them open, you start to see, and you start to see, for instance, you know, the, the heel counter of a boot is supposed to be made with full leather. You know, this is, it should last you for 40 years. So it holds the boot together. Well, that's expensive and it takes time. You know, a full, a leather heel counter takes 18 hours to set, but you know, using a plastic or using no heel counter at all, takes a couple of seconds. And most people who are just going to wear their boots a couple of times a year won't notice. Um, and it really reduces the price of the boots. But I saw that and I said, look, I want to be able to wear my boots hard and I want to be able to sell an honest product. So we're not going to do that. So th there, was a, there was an opportunity here not just to try and innovate, but really almost to go back old school and do it the way it was done before and make them, make them strong. That's interesting. I, I, you know, you never really think about somebody doing R&D on boot making. And that, that's, the, <laughs> that's kind yeah, of cool. That's pretty that, awesome. That is really cool that you, that you took the time to kind of research all these things and, and, and work to find like, the best product possible for your, for your customers. And, that, and that's, that's important. I want to show you guys what I'm talking about. So this, this is a lady's boot and this portion here on the back, that is supposed to be made with the same quality of leather that goes on the soles. Oh, so wow. it, it's, it's designed to be really resilient and, you know, because the rest of the, of the leather has got different purposes, sure. you know, but that heel counter is what keeps your, 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 the, not only the it keeps your ankle in place, it provides this like focal point of, of structural integrity. And so you don't want it to flop around. And the other thing is that full leather will, ad will adhere and adjust to the moisture and the warmth from your feet. And so that you end up having this custom fitted boot at the end of the day, you know, after you've worn them. And that's part of it, that, that old school, you know, break it in period, that was part of it. And so that part still exists, but it shouldn't be painful while it happens. So the, the cheaper competitors, what do they do? Just put plastic there and then a cheap thin layer of, of leather around that or? So this is one of our boots cut in nice. half. This is actually one of my original prototypes. I have run over this boot with my truck. <laughs> <laughs> but let me show you something here. So this here is the heel counter. So you can see even internally how there's a different color there. Right. Yeah. This is the same leather that we use on the sole and it's tough. I mean, this is like, I can't, you can't bend it and you definitely can't tear it. Here is a competitor who won't be named. <laughs> and this is theirs. That looks totally different. So this is the, here's, here's what's the crazy part. This is the, their leather. You see that? Oh, wow. It's fake. It's a uh. covering. It's hiding the fact 
because all they have back there is plastic. And so what this means is that it can't take any abuse. And the first time you wear it, it will adjust, right? You can heat up that plastic with your feet and it'll mold to your foot. But then it sets and it will never change again. But your feet change. They swell throughout the day. Um, you grow, you know, you put on weight, you lose weight. And so all that affects the way your feet and your ankle shape are. So you combine that with the abuse that you may be giving it by using it. And eventually that's going to dry out and it's going to crack. And when it cracks, you have to replace the boot. You can no longer just resole it and keep using it. Right. So yeah, that, I mean, that's that, kind of... Go ahead, Joe. No, I was just gonna say. I mean that 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 boot you just showed us. I I assume that that probably is a lower price point, but the the quality of the materials is is not as good as something that you'd see in your boot or another high quality boot. Yeah, I was gonna That's, say the same. Just uh, it, it sometimes it pays to pay a little bit more for your product and know you're gonna get a great product rather than a little bit up front and have to buy a new one in a year or so and it. it it's not worth it sometimes. I mean, I agree. There's what's that old saying that uh, something along the lines of that if you if you you pay a high price once you cry once, but if you <laughs> yeah. pay that low price you cry because you have to keep paying it as you keep replacing that product. Oh, something yeah. like that. I, I feel like George W. Bush fool me once. <laughs> can't be <fooled> again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so t- talk a little bit more about the uh, the leather part of it. Um, I mean, I'm ignorant when it comes to to boot materials and leathers and, and stuff like that. It, is there like a particular type of uh, generally like a type of cow that the uh, boots are typically made out of? Is it like a usually like a younger cow or an older cow? Do you, how does that work? It's a great question. So there's there's a lot of variability in the leather world. You know, there's the the method that you tan it. There's the age of the cow, and then when you've you know harvested that hide. There's, you know, top grain all the way down to what we call genuine leather at the bottom. If you ever see the words genuine leather, run. You know it's a piece of dirt. Uh, <laughs> it's marketing. And, and, they, and that's literally genu- – genuine leather means this is, the, this is the shittiest piece of leather that you could possibly buy. I've seen, um, that, on my, I've seen that on my baseball glove. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so what we use is – uh, is full grain. So we don't even just use top grain. We use the entire piece. And when you cut it open, you can see the difference. Now, this is the, I'm trying to show you guys here. This is the outermost piece. See how it's, it's got that brown all the way through? Yes. It's rough yeah. on the underside. So you can also tell by cutting a boot in half how, what kind of tanning process the leather's gone through. So we, we do a lead-free chrome partial chrome tan process and then we retan it uh with a total veg tan and we let it soak long enough and we tumble it long enough to go all the way through the leather a lot of people trying to cut their time period down they don't and so there'll be a white line or even a bluish tint through the middle because they didn't tan it long enough so all of these things to your old, to your your point ben about paying a little bit extra they all add up i mean the the thickness of our leathers and the cost of our leathers is already significantly more than what an entry-level boot might be but here's the here's a separate piece so separate from just quality it's a piece that we're particularly proud of which is the age of the of the of the cows that we use so if you want a soft leather this is you know the most premium cuts generally the traditional way of doing it is to get calf skin and when i went down this route i actually went to not only the tanneries, but I went to some of the farms and I wasn't willing to use calfskin. Um, You know, I don't want to disparage. There's a lot of different reasons why people make the choices they make, but that wasn't one that we wanted to make. Um, On a practical matter, a a calf can render maybe one or two individual boots, whereas an adult can render 10. So just your your utilization here and the demand you're having to use on animals is, is drastically different. Not to mention the harvesting process, not something we wanted to participate in. Right. So the alternative then is, okay, you use older cows, older cattle that have lived their whole life. And so we found a, a tannery that we work with that has a series of uh, dairy farms, and we work with them to select our hides. And so these are tougher 
but that has a, has a, has a benefit, which means they're stronger, right? They may not be as soft, but they're stronger. And then the other thing is people don't want them is because they have imperfections. They have scars. They've lived a whole life. Well, those things are interesting. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, one of the things with, with our leather and even in this example that I, that I pulled up to you is look at all that grain in it, the hot, you know, the, the textures and the marks on that, you know, it, it, it comes really interesting rather than being this like fake flat, you know, uh, matte look. So we said, okay, great. They're stronger and they're interesting looking. We just need to solve this softness process. And so we came up with a way that we simulate them being walked in essentially. And, you know, this is drawing on some of the knowledge that was already out there and some of our own, just throwing things against the wall to see what stuck. And that way, when you get the boots, they're already, they feel broken in, you know, that you still have that fresh heel counter. So it's still ready to, to be molded directly to your shape. But the, the vamp, which is the lower part, you know, the foot part is the vamp and then the uppers, um, those are already soft and they don't have to be broken in. That's awesome. So, so do you source your, uh, your leather or you source your, your boots, uh, from Mexico? So our tanneries and our leather sourcing is in Mexico for our standard cowhide. That's correct. And that's in Guanajuato? And it is. Yes. It's, it's all, all, I mean, the, the, the history there is stunning. Yeah. Um, Leon, Leon you know, Guanajuato is like the boot making capital of the world, isn't it? it's the leather capital of North America for sure. And, and maybe the whole world, you know, I mean, there's hundreds of tanneries, uh, shoes, saddles, all sorts of things. And the, you know, the Vaquero tradition there, which is, you know, Texas and Mexico, you know, give and take, it, it goes back hundreds of years. Did you have a uh, trouble trying to get in that with that, uh, you know, trying to get the leather from that region and then, figuring out how to import it into the U S and if there were any issues with that or it's a, hurdles you had to do. It's a great question. And I'm going to, I'm going to shift it a little bit. The, the hurdles that we encountered were really about finding quality boot makers who respected the handcrafted arts. So what I mean by that is that, you know, the big brands all of them have either all of their production or a majority of their production in Mexico these days. Even a lot of the ones that are like made in Texas, you know, they have a factory here. They still outsource, um, mm -hmm. hopefully to Mexico, a lot of them to China, um, which, you, uh, you know, I've never seen a cowboy from China, but there's a, there's a <laughs> lot of girls from Mexico. And, um, and, 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 and that's not a bad thing, but here's what happens is if you were to go to Lyon, there are four factories that are massive. They have hundreds of employees. They have assembly lines, essentially. They have machines that automate, like if you were like the, you know, when you last uh, a pair of boots is when you stretch the leather around the foot shape. And then once it's on there, you start assembling different things and you, you know, attach it to the sole, et cetera. They've got machines that just pull it over. It takes four seconds, you know, um, as opposed to having to have a craftsman do it uniquely. And so what you get is you can go in there and you can see there's brand X, there's brand Y, and there's brand Z, and they're all made from the same place, and they're all made uh, on this automated assembly line. So when I, went, when I went down there, you know, I toured some of them. And you know, these guys are going to want you to, to, to come with uh, a certain mindset, which is efficiency. And so this is why you start getting things like, um, you know, if you were to look inside of the boot, you've got to attach the you know the, the traditionally it's the leather insole we'll call it the midsole to the rest of the boot and the outsole and so you use a leather welt well you've got to attach the that that midsole to that welt so what we do is what they used to do 100 years ago which is you hand channel in a a uh, basically like a a uh, you cut a channel in that leather and you peel it back and you sew it directly to that other piece uh, you sew it directly. So you got leather to leather from the, the leather welt to the leather midsole. Well, that takes a long time. And so what they do now is they offsite, you have some other factory that pre-assembles a whole bunch of midsoles that have this canvas glued to them. And then you use that to attach to the leather welt because it's so much faster. Well, it's faster, but it also is a point of failure. It also allows them more moisture. And the other example we talked about earlier with the plastic and the heel counters. So they weren't willing to, neither were they not willing to innovate, but they also didn't want to do things that 
slow down the rest of their production lines. Thankfully, um, I had a, a friend of a friend. I mean, this is funny the way the world works. Is a friend of a friend that I went to college with um, has a small workshop down there. And, you know, it's, it, you know, we're talking about dozens, not hundreds. And we, I went down there and spent months and he taught me the craft. And from there, we were able to work together to say, okay, what do we want to change about this? Where do we want to, to reuse the old school techniques and where do we want to change things? And so the, the challenge wasn't about sourcing, um, to the different material well, I mean, this is own challenges sourcing right when you're a small fish people don't want to work with you but the biggest hurdle of all was being able to find uh someone to to teach me but that was willing to to commit to quality and also to experiment awesome. that's awesome I, it's uh it's awesome that you went to to Guanajuato to to learn the craft it's uh i almost kind of uh uh make it similar to like a, a, a top chef, you know, the top chefs in the world, they go to, they go to France cause that's the Mecca of, uh, of the culinary world. And, and the, and, and the, the Mecca of the, uh, the boot making world or the leather world is, is Guanajuato. And you went there to, to learn the craft. I think that's amazing. I love that analogy. Actually, that's the first time I've heard that. I, I think that's fantastic. When, when so we'll uh, see that up on your uh, website here, probably uh, <laughs> a week or two. Thanks for my marketing copy guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, Going to Mexico, I mean, you had, you had a, a friend there that, that helped you, you know, work through all this stuff, but what other kind of uh, challenges did you see in conducting business kind of in another country? You know, I mean, I'm sure there's import, export taxes you got to deal with and I mean, shipping and things like that. What, what kind of challenges did you, did you face in that respect? You know, Mexico runs on relationships. Um, you know, there's a lot you could talk to about the differences between doing business here and, and, and doing business there, um, which you could talk about from America to most countries. Um, but it runs on relationships. And there's this shared cultural affinity between Texas and Mexico. And so it made it, I was lucky, you know, I think all along, all along this entire journey, I've been, I've been so lucky. I mean, uh, you know, the friend who made the introduction to begin with, but to go down there in this sense, I was lucky because um, a lot of things felt familiar to me. And I think that I felt familiar to the folks that I was dealing with. One of, one of my favorite things is that, so, uh, and I've done business in Mexico in the past, and this always happens when you go down there. It's like, so we're going to go out to dinner, right? And so they go and they, and they're like, we're going to order for you. And the first thing that comes out is cricket tacos. <laughs> And they expect wow. you to be like, oh my God, I'm not going to eat that. And I'm like, pass the hot sauce. I've had these before. <laughs> I've helped eat the cricket taco. And they're like, oh, and they get a kick out of it. Then they go, okay, we're going to bring something you can't handle. And they go to the kitchen, they come back and they bring out a jalapeno. And I'm like, okay, great. Eat the jalapeno. I've had this. So then they, they just keep increasing. And finally they find some like habanero ghost pepper and it just lays me out. I'm on the floor like crying. And, <laughs> you know, it's fantastic because they've won, but yet I like held my own, you know. So the experiences like this, I think, go such a long way in, in Mexico. That's great. That's great. So, I mean, the boot industry, I, I feel like, you know, I'm sure you have a lot of competition. Uh, a lot of different boot companies out there. Was it challenging kind of getting started? You know, our approach um, has been to do our own thing. You know, there's, um, we're, it's funny, right? Because you have these legacy brands, you know, that have been around for a hundred, over a hundred years. You have these, you know, a few new like direct to consumer brands. And so they're doing the social media game and doing big ad buys and they've got all this venture capital money behind them. and you know, it's, it's two of us and we have to sell boots to stay in business. You know, we don't have a whole bunch of funding to go and do stuff like that. We don't have a private equity firm that's, you know, looking to make some big exit and grab market share. So we have to move quickly. So we've run the company essentially like a local brand. And that's why, you know, before COVID-19, we were doing these pop-up shops. Uh, we've been involved with Austin Rodeo. Uh, we're a big supporter of the Hill Country Conservancy here. You know, the other, the other you know, pillar that we hang our hat on is going to be land conservation and, and just being way too proud of Texas. Um, and, and, and it's been really rewarding because it turns out there's a lot of other folks out there, too, that 
connect with what you connect with. And so we're trying to be true to ourselves. And so far it's been working. That's great. And then uh, like what you just said right now, and, and I read a little bit about it on your website. Uh, I, I believe part of, part of the revenue that, that you generate goes to Texas land conservation efforts. I think there's a couple of uh, groups you work with. Uh, what, what made you passionate about that? And, and, you know, how did you get involved in that? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's, it's a, it's a combination of things, which is one, you know, I wanted to pay homage to our namesake, the Chisos Mountains out in Big Bend National Park. And I wanted to figure out a way that we could give back. So some of this was just this conscious effort in that regard. Um, but the other side of it is, you know, try and imagine the company that you want to work for. You know, you want to work for one that does something that you think is awesome. You want to work for one that um, is a active member of the community and you want to work for one that, you know, treats its employees well and gives you, you know, chances for, for experimenting and doing things you've never done before. And so I just wanted to create the company I always wanted to work for. And the, so that meant that we needed to have some sort of giving back that was like built into the core of the company and land conservation is a natural fit um, because one, I've been going to these places my whole life and I want to make sure that there's, still around for, you know, my kids one day and, and future generations. And then two, you know, most folks who are into cowboy boots are familiar with the land. You know, we're talking about hunters and fishers and cowboys and people with ranches. And they understand that, you know, even if you're using it for a commercial enterprise, there's this stewardship that is, you know, ingrained in, in working with the land and, and frankly, which is being Texan. That's beautiful. Yeah. And that's, that's great that you're, you're, you're giving back to the community and, and helping with uh, Texas land conservation. I think that's great. Um, you, you have some interesting artwork on the boots. Uh, I was looking at pictures of the, the top part of the boot. Uh, where did you get the idea for that and, and the, the designs for that? I mean, this is that part where I said, like, way too proud of Texas. That's, <laughs> that, that fits us even in the designs of the boots. So, you know, the, the first design is... Uh, it's the front has got the sunrise and the back has got the moon and the stars, but they're all set over the outline of the Chiso Mountain range in big bend. And the second boot has got more of an abstract design and outside of Terlingua, which is in technically inside big bend is this hike. And then that hike, they have these petroglyphs, you know, these old stone carvings from natives from, from generations ago. And I took photos of them and I'd been out there on, you know, several times hiking and, and I, basically did my interpretation of them. And so both of the boots kind of harken back to the Chisos area. That's yeah, it, awesome. sounds like, it sounds like your boots have the heart and soul in Texas in them. <laughs> they do. They do. You know, and uh, it's been a challenge because we're, we're working on some new stuff and finding, you know, selecting the piece that resonates uh, not only with ourselves, but with others is, is a little challenge, challenging because, you know, Texas is just full of all these incredible places. Right. Anything uh, you can share with us at all? Little insider uh, tips or anything? <laughs> you know, if, if you go to our Instagram, we recently teamed up with Jonathan Terrell. He's a honky tonk guy from Austin. And the photo may or may not be showing something that is under development. Awesome. Nice. Here, awesome. here first. That's cool. So, I mean, it sounds like your, your, your boots have a lot of uh, history and tie to Texas. Do you, do you, uh, are you seeing a lot of sales and, and, uh, and interest from, from people in other states? Surprisingly, yes. You know, there's, there's ex-Texans, right? You know, ex, expats of sorts who, uh, who are homesick or who, are, who know good boots. Um, but I've also been really surprised that, you know, we sell about a quarter of our boots outside of the state of Texas. And I thought we might sell 1%. And People like Texas. You know, I think Texas is polarizing. You know, there are definitely folks who are like, you guys are just full of yourselves. Please go away. <laughs> but there's a whole other set of people who are just fascinated with Texas and they get a kick out of it. And there's this, you know, this uh, persona to Texas. Um, and then there's another section of people who just don't care about any of that. They just want a good pair of boots. All right. Yeah, I uh, was thinking back to, so since you went to UT, have you thought about trying to team up with their little uh, cowboy um, kind of mascots at the end of the end zones uh, for football games, trying to see if you could fly some boots for them or anything? 
as a great idea and i would love to do that type of stuff so if you guys are listening give me a shout <laughs> awesome that's awesome. So uh, right now you have it's it's all like a, like basically like cow leather uh, boots that you have available. Do you plan to do any uh, different types of skins on your boots? Yes. The delay has been just like we wanted to feel comfortable with how the cow hides were being harvested and the animals were being treated. We want to do the same thing for the exotics. This becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, depending on what exotic you're after, they aren't on this continent and you've got a long way to travel. Um, and other people just don't want you to come and poke around. Um, so we're, we're working towards that. You know, there's, there's some stuff coming down the line. You know, I think that, uh, not to give anything away, cause I don't know if that we're going to do exactly this, but you know, ostrich is pretty well known, you know, especially oh, yeah. like in South Africa, right. You know, they, 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 they farm ostrich, like we farm cattle. Um, and uh, there's some other more interesting things that are right in our backyard as well that we're looking into. That's good. We'll keep an eye out for them. That's awesome. I wanted to go a little bit into your background because, you know, trying to prepare for this and looking at your LinkedIn page, you know, I noticed that you had a huge background in kind of software and startup texts and how do you feel that, you know, your experience with that prepared you kind of get you in the business mind to, to take off this company? And it's certainly been a, a windy road. That's for sure. You know, the, I feel like always when you look back hindsight, you know, it's like everything you did kind of prepared you for what you're doing now. And, you know, I, I, you know, had a screen printing company, you know, that's all I mostly paid for college. I did websites and then I, then I went into design and then I went out to San Francisco and, and actually worked for a few companies out there doing enterprise sales. And then we did the crypto startup, which requires you to kind of figure out how to start something out of nothing. And, you know, with, with Chisos, I feel like I've, bringing all those things together. You know, I, I've read some of the Reddit comments, which is always a bad idea. <laughs> and, you know, if, if people like to talk trash about our big social team and our big this team. And, you know, it's so corporate and blah, blah, blah. And what they don't realize is that there are two people doing everything. You know, when you call the company, I answer the phone or Katie answers the phone. And then I pack up your boots or Katie packs up your boots. You know, I did the logo. I did the website, you know. And so these things aren't because I'm, I'm any special person. It's just because I was just by dumb luck had done all these things in, in previous positions. And, you know, I think the, the tech background in particular, in particular is very uh uh, is it prescient? Whatever the word is, you know, like it, 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 I just, again, just, it happened to be that we were selling software to manufacturers. And so I spent a few years traveling around the United States, Mexico, and Europe, going to manufacturing facilities, figuring out uh, how they made their things and, and how we could help them ensure quality control and, and maybe you know, a little bit more efficient. And so I got exposed to this whole world. So when I went down the boot making route, I was like, Oh, like making things like I just understood a little bit more about the supply chain, um, which I wouldn't have had any idea about if it hadn't been for, for those roles in software. Yeah, that's awesome. You got to love that when, uh, you know, you're younger and you're just like, man, this is so long and boring. Why am I doing this? And then it comes down later. It's like, man, I really know what's going on here and I can ask the right questions and move it along. That's awesome. You know, I had a, a piece of advice that, you know, I feel like I've gotten to that age. I'm approaching my mid thirties. I'm not, you know, I don't have any <laughs> wisdom, but I, I am, I have enough to realize that all those like cliche things that people told me, like they're all true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like there's the secret to life. You know, everyone's telling you it. You just got to learn it yourself. Cause we're all a bunch of jackasses sometimes, but one of the pieces of advice was that, um, you know, when you're in a role or you're wherever you're at stage of your life, learn as much as you can and practice. And I was always like, what am I practicing for? You know, it's not like you're like, here's the path and I know I'm going to be, you know, in the World Cup one day, so I need to do these steps to get there. Um, but you really just want to get the reps because you never know what's going to come down the line. And you're like, oh, my God, I've been doing that for five years. So now I can apply that skill set over here. 
And so again, it's just dumb luck that I was in a position to learn some of this stuff that I can now apply to cowboy boots, which I never would have been able to put together going forward. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, two man crew, have you guys thought about uh, expanding at all or still kind of working out the kinks now? Yeah. So, you know, before Corona hit, uh, we were looking at opening a retail store in Austin and hiring up for that. You know, we've had a, a bunch of support from people in the community and we have a lot of folks who want to just come by. They either want to try the boots on in person or they just want to meet you. And, uh, and, and so, you know, our, our dream, by the way, is I would love to have like, so what we would do is we would have people come over to the house and we'd say, come on over, sit on the front porch, let's drink some sweet tea, have a coffee, you know, and kind of shoot the breeze, right? You know, before when we got in here, Ben, you're like, hey, I'm the guy who just wants to come over here and kind of shoot the shit a little bit. And, and I'm oh, like, yeah. that's my type of person, you know? So we would, we want to have a store that's, it's almost like it's a place to come hang out. And we happen to have cowboy boots over here that you can check out. Um, but it's really more about uh, that in-person, you know, it's, again, it's relationships. That's, a, um, that's, that's so an experience. That's what we want it to be. You know, again, going, going back to the beginning, like I wasn't joking when I said like, I want to build the company that I've always wanted to work for. And I'm going to keep trying as hard as I can to do that. You know, as long as people keep buying boots and they keep letting me. And that's awesome. I feel like that's kind of the Austin way, you know, I feel like other towns or cities, it doesn't work that well when you can just go to a business and hang out, you know, you've got Yeti downtown and who knows how much they sell out of that store, but it's always packed. And I think they got an open bar there and it's just a lot of people kind of hit that up before they go downtown for a beer and, you know, great views. And so that's an awesome uh, idea to, for a store. I've had many a beer at that course, <laughs> yeah. at the Yeti store. So have I. <laughs> Will, so did, uh, did COVID-19 slow down uh, your efforts or has it kind of been the same? How has that affected you? We thought we were going to get away from being hit by it, but we got hit just like everybody else. I mean, I mean first of all, we took a, a big cut in revenue because we couldn't do any more in-person events. You know? And that was you know, a quarter to a third of, of what we were bringing in. And then we saw you know, the, moment, the moment the national emergency was declared, we saw this, 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 you know, drop off and it's been like, it'll come back. You know, it came back when they had the stimulus checks and then it kind of goes down. And, <laughs> and so, you know, our, our tact and our approach to this has been, you know, like one, let's just keep engaging with people. So we're putting out as much content as we can. You know, it's part of why when you reached out to me to, to jump on the air, I was like, this is perfect. Let's, let's go out and let's, you know, we may have to do this remotely, but let's have some fun with it. Um, and you know, we're, we're a lean operation. Thankfully, thank, thank God we didn't open that retail store, uh, and take on that overhead. You know, we, again, dumb luck. We dodged a bullet with that one. You know, I didn't plan that. I wasn't some, it just, we just, it just worked out. Um, and the other thing though, is we've been looking at how, how can we give back even in a small way? You know, so, you know, we, there's a, there's a store in town called Slow North and they've got their own retail operation and, and they also have an in-house sewing team and they started sewing mask covers. So there's this whole thing, right, where the doctors couldn't get enough N95 masks and then they couldn't even get surgical masks and those were falling apart. So, so North started sewing masks that you would place the N95 in or that would hold the N95 on your face. And so they're not medical grade, but they're approved by the hospitals and they were, the hospitals were clamoring to have them for doctors and other medical staff. And so Slow North was already doing that. And so we said, okay, how can we help out? So we raised some money on our site and we started giving 5% of all revenues towards those, those mask covers. And, you know, at one point I felt like, look, it's not that much, right? You know, we're, we're, it's kind of a small contribution. And, uh, you know, one of my godparents, he said, look, if you give one person a mask and it keeps that one person from getting sick, that's a huge impact. And just imagine, you know, if you're giving them to doctors, you know, it, it makes a big difference. So we've, we've found some solace, you know, when I look at the, the revenue numbers in one way, you know, at least the fact that we're able to, you know, contribute in some, some method to the way the local um, fight against the, the virus is that you know, kind of offsets it, at least emotionally. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I love that you said that uh, you saw a little boost when the stimulus checks came out. I was always curious <laughs> how people are going to spend that. And I think that's awesome that, 
you know, the people that didn't necessarily weren't hurting horribly for that found a, an awesome product to, to pick up and use that for. So that, that's great. Tell us, tell us, tell us more about the, those masks. I, I thought I saw that they were like, um, I thought they were like leather. <laughs> no, we, 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 be we tough to breathe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, Hannibal Hector right up in here, you know, <laughs> they look like leather. No, they're, they're, they, uh, some of them are from denim, but they're, they're, they were, a lot of them were from donated materials or whatever we could get the, we could get our hands on, you know, um, slow North again, had a lot of fabric in house and they had some connections, but there's been this scramble for anything, anything related to, to, to mass production or gown production or all this type of stuff. So they've, they've been from a variety of materials. We, we didn't come out with any Hannibal Lecter mask that <laughs> That's hilarious. So you have a, it looks like in, in behind you, you have like a, a rack with, uh, with boots, cases of boots back there. Do you keep all your inventory at home? We have an offsite uh, storage facility. And so that's where it's, you know, we keep most of the inventory and then we have stuff here that we either are doing experiments on or that we have, we have some of everything so that when an order comes in, we can make sure that we get it out quickly. And uh, you mentioned earlier you you have a uh, uh, a brand ambassador. It looks like a, a musician that uh, that joined your team. How, how'd you connect with him? Yeah, Jonathan Terrell is awesome. He's just a great guy, and he's a local Austin musician. And uh, he was introduced to me through a friend, and he played our launch party back in November. And I had. You know, I'd actually seen him play at the White Horse and, and play around town uh, for a few years. So to have him play our launch party was awesome. And he put on a hell of a show. And so we've been just kind of in touch ever since. And uh, it just made a lot of sense. And so he is our official boot, uh, first boot, first musician we've sponsored. And he, we're his first official boot sponsor. Um, it's kind of awesome. I mean, it, it really feels like, you know, to like an Austin, small Austin company and an up and coming Austin musician kind of teaming up, you know, neither one of us is huge. Um, and, but we both really believe in each other. And, and, uh, and like I said, you got to go see him, but he's just, he's, he's mostly he's just an awesome guy. That's super cool. That, that's, that's cool awesome. that you uh, connected with a, with an Austin musician. Do you see any, uh, any other collabs with, with Austin companies in the, in the future? I mean, I'd love to. I mean, that's part of, you know, having fun with this, right, is, is who can we team up with? I mean, you know, Slow North brought us into the operation that they were doing, and so we were thankful to be a part of that. Uh, working with Jonathan Terrell has been great. You know, uh, we also had, uh, at the launch party, Sir Woman and, and David Ramirez also did it, and that was a blast. You know, um, I mean, while I'm giving shout-outs, you know, Matt Walski over at Parlor and Yard, who hosted us, has, has still been a, a, a big help ever since. And Matt and I are working on something um, to try and raise funds for local businesses. Um, and so, you know, our slogan at Cheezos is do right, love Texas. And it means to us, it means, you know, build the business and do the right thing. You know, when no one's looking, do the right thing. And at the same time, take care of, of, of the place you're from. Love Texas is about land conservation, but it's not just about land conservation. You know, at times like this are kind of unique. So we're coming out with a, a line of apparel and a hundred percent of all of the profits from it. So we take out the cost to make it. And then a hundred percent past that is going donated to help small businesses that have been hit even harder than we've been hit. That's awesome. And uh, so, so that, that, that should be coming out. Uh, take a look at the, you know, when you see it. And uh, I think it's kind of great. You know, it's like Texans helping Texans. Absolutely. And, and they can find that information on your website? Chisos.com, C-H-I-S-O-S. And you're also on uh, several different social media platforms, is that right? Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you have to be these days. So we're on Instagram and Facebook and a little bit on Twitter. Very cool. Very cool. So what is your favorite barbecue spot in Austin? Oh, you know, if, if I said that out loud, <laughs> I might get booed off of the stage here. You know, <laughs> there's, there's a lot that I like. I'm going to go political on, on that answer. Barbecue is the only thing. I'm like, there's, a lot that, there's a lot that I like. Um, but you should ask me something easier, which is what's my favorite barbecue out in West Texas? Okay, what's which, your favorite barbecue in West Texas? There it is. Uh, <laughs> Convenience West out in Marfa. If you guys haven't had it, it's phenomenal. Uh, Mark down there actually 
bought a pair of our boots and has been wearing them every day while he mans the pit, which is like the best test I've ever heard of. Oh yeah. And, uh, but that barbecue is fantastic. It ain't nothing to play with. Uh, you know, Franklin should, should be worried or they should team up <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> That's cool. Do you recommend, uh, any, uh, good business books? Good business books or any, any book that, that you read recently? Oh man. Put me on the spot here. Um, you know, I, I finished reading, a, uh, that book. Uh, it's, I'm forgetting the title of it, but Harvard had a, had a, had a, or excuse me, Stanford had a class on essentially how to build the life that you want to lead. And it was like their number one class in the history of the school. And so they, they took it and they made it into a book. And, uh, and so I just finished that book and then I finished the Edward Snowden book, which I recommend you read. Nice. We might never do Zoom calls again after you finish reading it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, and then I, I, uh, I recently bought um, the new like Texas, the book. What, again, I'm terrible with titles. Forgive me. But there's this giant new like anthology of Texas that came out. The book's like this big. And uh, it would probably take me 10 years to read it, but I got it. That's, That's awesome. Like a little coffee, uh, coffee table book or something. Well, it's, 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 it's like a textbook. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Be the coffee table. Itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I did? I did watch uh, Lonesome Dove finally. Thank nice. you, quarantine. And I got to <laughs> tell you, it's awesome. Like, it started, I was like, I don't get it. And about 30 minutes into it, you're like, okay, I get it. And then I came to be like, man, is Gus going to make it? Like, I just got like, tied into it. <laughs> it's like 10 hours, too. So, awesome. so, so do you have a favorite uh, Western or cowboy movie? Oh man. See, this is the thing. You put me on the spot. Then I'm like, favorites are hard, you know, like you guys like tombstone phenomenal favorite. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I feel like I always have like a top couple, you know, there's always something out there you're not thinking of, but oh, yeah. uh, I, I'll, I'll just, you know, tombstones was, was uh, probably influential on my upbringing. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Well, I think we're, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up here. I wanted to ask you, um, for, for anybody out there that's, that's starting a, a business here in Austin and, and you know, don't have any experience in, in, uh, in the business world, what kind of advice would you give them? Let me get philosophical for a moment. <laughs> you know, I think that it really comes down to just moving forward. Um, you know, you asked me, like, what's my best business? favorite business book and i wanted to say school of hard knocks um and it's kind of true right like you get an mba and the first thing that you do when you get out is they want you to get experience you know and so if you're if you're feeling like you don't have the credentials to do something that's wrong you do the fact that you're breathing means that you can do it you know don't don't wait for permission from some other organization or person to credential you uh, just go and do it. And, you know, you may have to get creative, you know, look at your constraints as advantages. Um, you know, I have a, I have a good friend who challenged me when Corona hit, he said, I want to, I want you to ask yourself two questions. One is, uh, what would you do if your sales go to zero? How do you survive? And then number two, how do you actually come out of this and it be the best thing that happened in your company's history? And those are crazy questions to kind of ask yourself, but they're very similar almost to what you have to ask yourself when you're first starting out, which is, you know, how do you overcome this, these, these crazy odds? But rather than think about them that way, think about them as actually the tool to getting you where you want to go. That's great advice. That's great advice. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank it's you. Not, so it's not mine. I copied it from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for, for joining us on, on uh, this podcast. Cheese those boots. Uh, check out their website. Check them out on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, Will, it's it's obvious you're really passionate about your product, and uh, I'd like to get a pair for myself. I got I got to go online and, and find the right ones. Oh yeah, thanks, Will. Go. That was great. Thank y'all. I appreciate you having me out. Thanks a lot. We'll take care. We'll we'll, we'll have to get you back on uh, real soon. I'll be down. Let's do All it. Right. All right. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Will. Take it easy. Thanks for listening to the Moon Tower Business Podcast episode with Will Roman from Chizo's Boots. If you've liked what you've heard so far, please consider subscribing to our podcast on whichever platform you listen to. Also consider giving us a good rating. We also wanted to provide a little teaser for next week's podcast. We are meeting up with Sarah Martin Biggie and Edgar Rico from Nixa Taqueria. 
They talk about their background and the journey that took them to where they are. Look for that to come out next week and take care everybody and stay healthy.